know, mourning is a normal part of life. At different times, we see it all around us. There are a number of different things that people mourn from time to time. If you turn the news on, you'll see there are a number of people that are mourning the potential and, according to some sources, even the likely loss of their sovereignty as a nation if you've kept up with what's going on in Europe. But we mourn a number of different things. And this morning, as we continue to work our way through the Sermon on the Mount, we'll be looking at the second of the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And as we mentioned last week, and we'll see again this week, we see Jesus making these statements that on the surface, whenever we consider them from a worldly perspective, they seem a little bit backwards. Because blessed is this idea of happy or fortunate, well off. And Jesus says, blessed are those who are, who are in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. That doesn't seem to go together with the way we typically think of things. But it's another statement that expresses a blessing of living up to God's standards. And we're going to look at just exactly what that means in just a moment. But it's a mourning that reflects what's in the heart. It's an expression that something is terribly wrong. It's an expression uh, that, uh, of someone being deeply troubled. And we see when we think about the concept of mourning, a lot of times we think about you know, people at, at funerals or we think about people that are, you know, something has gone very, very wrong. But as we consider Jesus saying, blessed are those who mourn, the first question that we want to ask is, what kind of mourning is he talking about? Is he talking just about generic mourning or any type of mourning? Or as we see in the Sermon on the Mount, it's something a little bit more specific than that. He's talking about a particular type of mourning because, as I mentioned, there are a lot of things that we mourn over. We mourn death. We mourn sickness. We mourn financial trouble. We mourn uh, problems in our careers. We mourn problems with family relationships. We mourn a lot of things. Some things we mourn. We should mourn some things maybe we shouldn't. We know that some mourning isn't right. For example, if we mourn, but it's prompted by jealousy or unrighteous anger, you know, I'm just going to go home and pout and sulk and mourn over the fact that somebody got the promotion that I wanted. Somebody else's life is going the way that I want my life to go, but mine isn't. If it's prompted by unrighteous anger, or if I'm upset by someone else's success and mourn over that. Of course, we know that's not what Jesus is talking about. He's not pronouncing blessing on those who are being unrighteous. And so we're not talking about any kind of mourning. Jesus isn't talking about just any kind of mourning. But in the context, it follows up on blessed are those who are poor in spirit. And if you remember, we talked about poor in spirit are those who recognize a spiritual bankruptcy before God, those who have assessed what their sin does to their relationship with God and how sin separates us from God. Blessed are the poor in spirit, those who are spiritually humble. We talked about last week. And this week, blessed are those who mourn. And contextually, we're really dealing with mourning over sin. Mourning over sin and its consequences. Mourning over sin and the effects that it has. And that's really the opposite of what we see in our culture today, isn't it? where sin is paraded before us as though it's something to be celebrated. It's something to be amused by. It's something that our culture not only says is okay, but our culture says it's good and it's right. What Jesus says here, and within the context, is very different than the message that our world sends. And this idea of parading and boasting in sin is not anything new. We see the Corinthian church had an issue with that as well in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. We see Paul is getting on to the church in Corinth where he says it's reported that there is immorality among you, an immorality of such a kind that does not even exist among the Gentiles. That someone has his father's wife. But you have become arrogant and have not mourned instead so that the one who had, uh, who had done this deed would be removed from your midst. You know what Paul is saying is there's sin in, in, in the church there in Corinth, and he says you need to be mourning, you need to be doing something about it, but rather what's going on in that church is they were boasting about it. Look how tolerant we are. 
When we look at our world today, it's very similar to that. The highest virtue is tolerance. You can't ever tell anybody that their way of life or that anything that happens today is wrong or wouldn't be pleasing to God. That just doesn't fit with the popular message today. But Paul is saying that there is sin and it should not be tolerated, it should not be accepted, it shouldn't be celebrated, it needs to be mourned and it needs to be dealt with. And so as we talk about this, we're dealing with mourning over sin. What follows when we realize our spiritual bankruptcy before God, our need for Him, blessed to the poor in spirit, is a mourning over the cause. A mourning over the fact that I have sinned and I have done something that is against my God and that should cause me to mourn. And if you want to know what that looks like correctly, and we've already seen the example of those who boasted in sin, but if you want to see an example of what mourning over sin looks like, turn with me, if you will, now to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22 and verses 60 to 62 Contextually, this is as Jesus' own trial before the high priest. It's before he goes to Pilate, and Peter has followed along. He's there in the courtyard, and he's begun to be recognized. But you were one of his followers too, weren't you? Now earlier, Jesus had already told the apostles, you're all going to leave me. You're all going to desert And Peter said, oh, no, 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 the rest of them may leave, but I'm ready to go to death for you. I'm not going to leave. And Peter told, or excuse me, Jesus told Peter, before the rooster crows, you'll deny three times that you know me. And that's what we see here in verses 60 to 62 in Luke 22. It says, Peter said, and this is the third of the denials. He said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And immediately while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Now that's a unique detail to Luke's gospel. The Lord turns and looks at Peter whenever Peter denies him. And so Peter knows what he's done. Jesus knows what he's done. And Peter knows that Jesus knows what Peter has done. And it dawns on him the gravity of what has just happened. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had told him before a rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And notice verse 62, we have, I would say, the proper response when we recognize that we have done something against our Lord. He went out and wept bitterly. Peter recognized that his sin was a big deal. And he doesn't just go, it doesn't say that he, you know, it, it, it choked him up a little bit. It, it bothered him mildly. Have you ever heard somebody talking about when they get really upset? There's some, you know, in our, I don't know if it's used up here, but I've heard it quite, you know, a, a good bit in the last few years. He was ugly crying. He couldn't contain himself. He recognized the seriousness and the, the, the gravity of the situation that he was in that he had just denied his Lord. Now keep in mind, this is the same Peter that as Jesus had given one of the most difficult teachings in John chapter 6 in his ministry, and the crowds left and they stopped following him. And Jesus looked at the twelve and he said, Do you want to go away too? And Peter is the one who answered and said, To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And now here's Peter while Jesus is on trial not standing up for that same truth. I don't know him, he said. When he recognized the gravity of what had happened, he wept bitterly. And it's important to note as we consider what are we mourning, what kind of mourning this is, this is more than mourning over getting caught. Peter is mourning his sin, not just the fact that he got caught in sin, you know, we see that today. People get caught in doing something wrong and oh, they're, they're so upset. But what they're really upset about is the fact that it was found out and what they're thinking is, I'll do it better next time where nobody will know it. That's not what we're talking about here. This is not a mourning or getting upset over getting caught. It's a mourning over the sin itself. We have to be careful that as we consider the gravity of sin that we don't find ourselves drifting into having the same attitude as our culture. Oh well, everybody sins, it's no big deal. After all, I'm only human. There are a number of phrases that get tossed around to excuse or justify sin. Boys will be boys. 
And these phrases are, made, are, are used to make light of something that should not be made light of. Sin is a very big deal. And that's why Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn. When we recognize just how big it is, it will bring us to that point. And so what should we mourn? Contextually, he's dealing with sin and its effects and the damage. But why should we mourn it? And that's where we get into the damage that it causes. Because sin hurts everything and everyone that it touches. You know, when we think about sins that are, that are mentioned specifically in Scripture, you think about you know, your sin, I think about my sin, and I can think about the damage that it caused, but we have example in Scripture as well. When we think about King David, a man after God's own heart, when you look at the, at the lifestyle that he led, whenever he got ready to make a move, it says over and over and over in the historical accounts that he inquired of God, but there was a time when he made a decision and he didn't inquire of God. You see, he'd sent his armies out to war, and he stayed in Jerusalem. And he happened to see the wife of one of his men. He committed adultery. It ended up ending a marriage. It led to more sin of murder. An innocent child died as a result, and it says in 2 Samuel 12, 13 and 14, that opportunity had been given for the enemies of God to blaspheme. Sin damages everything that it touches. And our sin hurts those around us. Paul talks about the damage that sin can cause in Romans chapter 2. And contextually, in Romans chapter 2, this is in the middle of a section where Paul is showing that everyone in the world has sin. He talks about the sins of the Gentiles and in Romans chapter 2, he's talking specifically about the sins of the Jews and what we're looking at. And in this section, he talks about, we're going to see the boasts that the Jews made. Oh, we're God's chosen people. We have all of these things. Look who we are. And he talks about the boasts that they make, and then he talks about the sins they commit, and he says, here's the effect of it. Here's the harm that sin causes. In Romans 2, beginning in verse 17, he says, If you bear the name Jew and rely upon the law and boast in God... You know His will and approve the things that are essential, being instructed out of the law. You're confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature, having in the law an embodiment of knowledge and of truth. That's quite a boast. We have the truth. We're the ones who teach everyone else. We are the light to the world. Verse 21, he says, you who teach another, do you teach yourself? You who preach that one shall not steal, do you steal? You who say that one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law through your breaking the law, do you dishonor God? And he shows them. The point being, they're not living up to the claim that they have. And notice he says in the following verse, verse 24, here's at least one effect of this sin. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, just as it's written. The people of God who were boasting in God because of their breaking of the law of God were causing other people to turn away from God. We wear the name Christian, which means we have to be very careful how we behave from day to day. Because if I go out from this place and somebody that knows I'm the... The, the preacher at the church here, and I go and treat somebody terribly in a business down the street, what do you think the odds are that they're going to be interested in never coming here? Probably not. When people know that we're Christians, we have to be careful. Well, any time, whether they know or not, but we have to be careful that we behave like Jesus because people are watching, the world sees, and it has a profound impact on the people around us. We wear the name Christian. Are we acting like Jesus? And that's a warning to us that people are watching. There is no such thing as a harmless sin. But unfortunately, we all have sin. And as we consider the mourning, it has to do with the sin that we have and its effects. 
But as we consider why do we mourn sin, we mourn it because of the damage that it caused. We mourn it because of the high price. We know the wages of sin is death. You know, that's exactly what Jesus paid. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 53. As God, through the prophet Isaiah, foretells what Jesus will go through in paying the price of sin. In Isaiah 53, beginning in verse 4, it says, Surely our griefs He Himself bore, and our sorrows He carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed Him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But He was pierced through for our transgressions, He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him, and by His scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray, each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on Him. He was oppressed, He was afflicted, yet He did not open His mouth. Like a lamb that's led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so He did not open His mouth. By oppression and judgment He was taken away. And as for His generation, who considered that He was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of My people, to whom the stroke was due, His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet He was with a rich man in His death, because He had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in His mouth. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the good pleasure of of the Lord will prosper in his hand. He's the guilt offering for us. We are healed by his punishment because he paid the price. As Paul said, the wages of sin is death. And that's exactly what Jesus paid for me and for you. Because that's exactly what I deserve. We mourn sin because it costs the highest price. We mourn sin because it breaks fellowship with God. Just a few chapters over as well in Isaiah in chapter 59. It says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it can't save, nor his ear so dull that it can't hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden His face from you, so that He does not hear our sins break fellowship with Him. It causes a separation. We mourn sin. Why? Because it separates us from the Creator. It separates us from our God. There is no such thing as a harmless sin. I know that's something our world says out there today. Well, that's a a victimless crime. That's a harmless sin. There's no effects of it. If nobody finds out, there's no problem. There's no such thing as a sin that does not do damage. We mourn sin because it damages everything and everyone that it comes into contact with. We mourn sin because of the effect that it has on our relationship with God. We mourn sin because there's absolutely no good in it. But as we consider the good news, as Jesus says, blessed are the poor, He has the good news, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The same way, blessed are those who mourn, and then He has the good news, for they shall be comforted. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10, we looked at just a, a few moments ago before the sermon. Paul speaks about the effects of godly sorrow or of mourning over sin. But the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret leading to salvation. Or another version will say, godly sorrow produces repentance. Comfort comes to those who mourn over sin because godly sorrow, mourning over sin, is what leads us to change, is what leads us to bring our lives into, uh, into confirmation or uh, to conform to the will of God, to be what He calls us to be. You know, and as we consider an example of this, let's go to Acts chapter 2. You know, and as we consider the, the, the sermon that was preached on the day of Pentecost, we, we emphasize very heavily, and rightly so, The obedience to the gospel found in verse 38. But something that's also very important for us to consider is what's found in verse 37. What motivated the response of those 3,000 people? 
In verse 37, after Peter has proclaimed that Jesus is the Messiah, he's shown from Old Testament scriptures that Jesus is the Son of God. He's the prophesied one. He has shown from Scripture, He has shown them what they've done in the mistake of killing Jesus Christ, of killing the one that they were looking for. And when they get to verse 37, they realize what's going on. And notice it says, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? We can't miss the importance of this verse and the response to the gospel because repentance and baptism only happen when our heart is affected, whenever we recognize the gravity of our sin, when we recognize our need for God because of what, what's happened. They were cut to the heart. They were upset over their sin. They realized they were in trouble. And it prompted them to ask, what do we do? They had to be cut to the heart first. Come to the point of having sorrow over sin. Before we come to verse 38, where, uh, where Peter says to them, Repent, and every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, their sins were washed away. They were saved in Jesus Christ. But it's only after they were cut to the heart and had sorrow over the sin that they had committed. And notice, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Notice what follows. You go from having a people who were cut to the heart, who were sorrowful over their sin, to when it talks about the fellowship of these Christians, you see a stark change. Verses 46 and 47, day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. We have a people now who are a fellowship of people who are glad. They're not mourning anymore. Not that they're not upset about the effects of sin, but they recognize their sin is gone. The blood of Jesus has washed their sins away. Now they're glad. They are praising God. They have favor with the people around them. You see an incredible transformation. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Forgiveness in Christ is ultimately what leads to that comfort. But as we consider the ways that God offers comfort, He gives us forgiveness, but He also... Before we conclude, I want to look at one more thing in a way that we can have comfort in turning to God is because God gives us a family in Christ in which we bear one another's burdens. In Galatians chapter 6 and verses 1 and 2, it says, Brethren, if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. We have comfort in the forgiveness that Jesus offers. We have a family of people around us, a church that understands because every one of us struggle, every one of us have sinned, every one of us need forgiveness, and we're there to lift one another up, to encourage one another. As the Hebrew writer says, to spur one another on to love and to good deeds. And when one of us finds that we have a burden that we need help with, we're there to bear one another's burdens. What a comfort it is to be in Christ. Because we have the blood of Jesus to wash our sins away, and we have the family of God to help uphold us, to encourage us. But in order to be comforted, we have to first understand the gravity of sin and have sorrow over it. Do you have sorrow over your sin? Is there something that you find in your life that you might need forgiveness for? Are you upset over something from your past or maybe even something that you're presently living in? When mourning over sin leads to change, we have forgiveness through Jesus Christ because that change involves turning away from sin. And when we come to God, it involves obedience to the gospel. Whenever we put Christ on in baptism, 
we can have assurance that our sins are washed away. What a comfort that is. And we gain the family of God to help us bear the burdens that we have from day to day. Do you need the comfort that Jesus offers, that our Lord offers this morning? You have that opportunity. If you're mourning over some sin, if you have some difficulty in your life that we can help you with, there's some way we can help you. If you need to respond to the gospel, to become a child of God, if you need to recommit yourself to following Him more closely, if we can help you in that, would you come while we stand and while we sing?